decide as I decide. I do as I do. Free will sits at the center of human thought, behavior, morality, and responsibility. But what may seem obvious may be strangely not so. We find people claiming it's obvious that there's no free will. We find people claiming it's obvious that there is free will. There's no doubt about it. It's perhaps the most dramatic, irresoluble clash in the whole of philosophy. We have inconsistent views, each of which is supported by overwhelming reasons. It's a mystery to me what's wrong with one of these arguments. So I regard free will as a complete mystery. Here's the deep problem of free will. On the one hand, our human sense is that our actions are fully free. On the other hand, our scientific sense is that every action is determined by a prior action. What is free will? Do we have free will? That's the big question. Free will is such a big question that the John Templeton Foundation has funded a multi-year study with experts in science, philosophy, and theology. The project is called Big Questions in Free Will. It has 60 participants, four conferences, numerous experiments and papers, all to research, test, discuss, and debate free will. I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn. In this Closer to Truth special, I follow the project over two episodes, asking the big questions in free will. The four-year Big Questions in Free Will project kicks off in Tallahassee, Florida, on the campus of Florida State University where participants gather to present their findings, state their cases, and deliberate the implications. How does the Big Questions in Free Will project address the issues? According to the leader of the project, Professor Alfred Mealy, one of its goals is to bring together scientists and philosophers. So in the science wing, who are the scientists? What are the kinds of problems they're working on? Well, uh, there are neuroscientists, uh, social psychologists, cognitive psychologists. Neuroscientists are working on, roughly, what goes on in the brain when people make decisions. Uh, also, the sense or feeling of causing something, of being an agent, uh, as opposed to, you know, something happening to you. Um, the social psychologists are studying things like uh, the effects of people's beliefs about free will on their behavior, and they're studying things like willpower. In the conceptual underpinnings wing, our main questions are traditional philosophical questions, like what are the necessary conditions for free will? So do you see uh, a cross-pollination between these wings? I do. Um, the philosophers and scientists meet together at uh, three conferences, and there will be a lot of uh, productive exchange of ideas. I begin with the scientists. For science to explain free will, it needs to start with the seat of thought and emotion, the brain. What does brain science say about free will? I ask Al Mealy for some history. I'll start with uh, an experiment that really got the ball rolling. It's by a neuroscientist named Benjamin Libet. So the task subjects had was to flex a wrist whenever they felt like it, and then after they flexed, they would report where a spot was on a very fast clock when they first felt the urge, intention, wish, will, decision to flex. And they were hooked up to two machines. So they were getting EEG readings from the scalp, and they were getting uh, muscle motion readings with uh, an electromyograph. And uh, what he discovered is that when subjects were regularly reminded not to plan in advance when to flex, you got an EEG ramp up that started at 550 milliseconds before the muscle burst. And that's about a half, half a second. A second. That's a long time in brain terms, half a second. Oh, it sure is. Now, the average time of first reported awareness of this mental event, the decision or intention or whatever, was 206 milliseconds before the muscle. About a fifth of a second. That's right. So there's a lag between the EEG ramp up 
and this reported time of first Which awareness. seems to indicate that the brain, without our conscious knowledge, is already planning, and then I'm suddenly aware of it, as if my consciousness, my so-called free will, is sort of a froth. And yeah. it, it's just kind of riding along, but has no impact on really what's happening. That's, yeah, that's exactly right. So uh, his thought is the brain is making these decisions about a third of a second before you become aware of them. So it's making them unconsciously. Free will has to be a conscious process, so free will's not involved. Many scientists concluded that the Lipid experiment abolished free will. But EEG readings on the scalp are weak. It's difficult to get precise measurements insulated from the brain. One neuroscientist in the Big Questions in Free Will project, Christoph Koch, is working to improve Libet's experiment by recording directly on the brain and by examining decisions that have consequences. We're trying to understand the neuronal mechanism that underlie a voluntary decision that traditionally people would say involves free will. Mm -hmm. And we know from, from previous experiments, there are several components to this. One component relates to this feeling that psychologists now call authorship or agency. Mm -hmm. I lift my right hand and I have a feeling that I, not you, not my parents, not my friends, were responsible for me lifting this hand. We know there's a specific locus in the brain that generates this, the, this conscious uh, sensation. We like to separate that out from the neural mechanism that actually gives rise to what I personally feel is this voluntary action. What are the actual mechanism? Where is the, 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 the decision first taken and what parts of the brain are involved in what sequence? So finally, I lift my right hand. And more interesting, from a practical perspective, can I predict this ahead of time? Can I maybe read off your brain signal so I can know one second ahead of time, are you going to move the right hand? Are you going to move the left hand? The other thing we're interested in is choices that involve deliberations, because that also brings in moral judgment. Should I be doing this? Is this a wise idea? Am I going to hurt somebody, etc.? And so there we, we're devising a slightly different paradigm where we, where we play a simple game where the patient is free to move one or the other hand at some command. We lift both of our hands. However, if you lift the same hand as I do, then you win one dollar. Right. And if we do this, yeah. you see, <laughs> then I win a dollar. And once again, this is much closer to the real decision that we care about because it has consequences and you deliberate rather than just, ah, it doesn't matter, pick this or this. They're, they're exactly identical. I can't pick out both, so I have to uh, take one. Christoph sends me to Cedar sinai Medical Center in West Los Angeles. A patient has graciously allowed me to observe as she undergoes brain surgery for epilepsy, and then afterwards as she participates in experiments of decision-making and free will. I meet the neurosurgeon, Dr. Adam Mamalek. We do an operation, a craniotomy, where we open the skull and put a sheet of electrodes on the surface of the brain. It covers the area that we think is involved, plus the periphery around it. Dr. Mamalek introduces his patient, Audrey. Uh, no, Hi. Right. Hello. Nice to meet you. Pleased to meet you. This yeah. is Audrey. It's a remarkable procedure. By charting Audrey's brain waves, neurosurgeons create a fine-grained map of her brain, enabling them to locate and remove the lesion that causes her seizures. At the same time, neuroscientists can examine brain activity during decision-making, seeking brain-based facts about free will. Caltech. Christoph's partner, neuroscientist Uri Maus, shows me the results. Basically, the patient and I are playing a simple version of the rock, scissors, paper <laughs> that, that children play. If I raise the mirror image of what you raise, then let's say I win. Okay. And if we raise the same hand, so if you raise uh, your right hand and I raise the right hand, then, then, then okay. you win. We start with $5, and every time she wins, I give her 10 cents, so I lose 10 cents and she gains 10 cents. And if she loses, it's the other way around. So it's, it becomes competitive. Oh, oh. We play for about 50 rounds. What we're interested in is finding the difference between preparatory activity towards uh, moving the left hand versus moving the right hand. To be able to predict which hand you will raise before the go signal telling you to raise your hand is even there. So we have 
this grid here, yeah. which is much closer to the source of the signal than you would have if it was EEG. So this grid is in her head here, and from this grid we see these wires coming out. And I get a beep either on the right ear or on the left ear, which tells me to raise my right hand or my left hand in order to beat the patient. And this is half a second before the go signal, so I know what I need to move, and I just wait half a second for the go signal and move it. Okay, let's, uh, let's, let's see what really happened. Okay. This is counting down five, four, three, two, one, and then go, 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 and we raise our hands. So if I win, my side of the response box lights up in blue, and if she wins, her side of the response box lights in red. Here's a screen behind Audrey, she can't see it, and the screen shows an arrow which hand she's going to raise according to the real-time system. So she's about to raise her right hand, and so, it was... It so was the, yeah, just the, the arrow comes on like just a fraction of a second before, before she moves. Right, and before the go signal. So we were able to beat her, and we, we played three times. We, I was able to win with a relatively large margin two of those three times. She was competitive about it. It had meaning. Yeah, that's, that's that was the important thing for us. So Ori and Christoph replicate Libet's experiment with more precision, literally on the brain, and the results are similar. Ori can predict what Audrey is going to do even before Audrey herself is aware of her own inner decision to do it. Does this suggest that free will is an illusion? That our conscious decision to act does not cause us to act? Free will and illusion, it just doesn't seem right. It seems more a philosophical question than a scientific one. So can philosophy help? I ask Al Mealy to explain the philosophy of free will. We have to start with this notion of determinism. And determinism is the idea that a complete description of the condition of the universe at any point in time, together with a complete list of all the laws of nature, would entail all other truths about the universe, including all truths about everything you'll ever do. Okay, that's determinism. Some philosophers say, well, you can't have free will in that case because you could never have done otherwise than you did. Well, suppose determinism isn't true. Then what do you have now? Well, they say randomness at the point of decision. And so that's not free will either. That's what they say. Either way then, there's no free will, but still, People feel as though they're free, and so the claim is, well, that feeling is an illusion. So there are philosophers called compatibilists, and compatibilists say that uh, even if determinism is true, people can act freely. What compatibilists think is that what you need is to be responsive to reasons in a certain way, so that if the reasons had been different, you would or might have acted differently. Even though there was no possibility that the reasons were different, based on the universe that we live in. That's right. <laughs> the other way to go is to say, no, you're right, free will does require that determinism be false, but the falsity of determinism doesn't just put you at the mercy of chance or randomness or luck. You're still enough in control of what you do to act freely. That kind of response is called a libertarian response. My own view is this. Either compatibilism is true or libertarianism is true. That either or proposition is more credible than the opposing proposition, which is no free will either way, free will is an illusion. Philosophers propose these two basic mechanisms to explain free will, compatibilism and libertarianism. Though they differ dramatically in characterizing free will, both counter the claim, made largely by scientists, that free will is an illusion. Al concludes that free will is not an illusion, that either compatibilism or libertarianism is correct. But as for which is correct, he is not prepared to decide. All these categories and labels and still no solution to the problem of free will. Perhaps we should re-examine the basic terms, free and will. I asked philosopher Walter Sinnott Armstrong. I take free to mean there's no barrier of the relevant sort. 
And when we're talking about freedom in the, in the context of free will and free action, we're talking mainly about physical barriers or psychological barriers to doing the things that you want to do. And to say that you're free to do it is then to say there are no relevant physical or psychological barriers to you doing the thing you want to do. So the classic critical question is to say, could you have done something otherwise? Right, but notice the word could doesn't really help. People seem to think it's clear what counts as could and what counts as could not. But you might say, oh, can you come to the movie with me tonight? No, I can't come, I've gotta work. Well, it's not that it's physically impossible, mm -hmm. it's that it would be too costly for me mm -hmm. because I need to get this work done. So even the word could has this relevant, it, to say you can do something is again to say, there's no relevant barrier or constraint. The key is relevant there, because in each, in each circumstance, you have to determine what's the relevant barrier that defines freedom. Right, and that's gonna depend on what your interest is, right? If your interest is whether or not to hold someone responsible, for example, then certain kinds of barriers are gonna be deemed relevant. It might be relevant that the person uh, is delusional doesn't know what they're doing. It might be relevant that they are locked into their room. That's why they couldn't leave and, and get to work in time. Whereas the fact that it's caused in a certain way in your brain, I think would not be relevant if the context is about whether to hold the person morally responsible. And so once we get clear about what we mean by freedom, then we can ask, are wills really free in that sense that we care about? And the answer is they're free in one sense. Walter claims the that the sense. definition of free depends on the situation. But science claims that no matter what the situation, the feeling of making a choice comes after brain activity, so free will must still be an illusion. But if so, why do we have that feeling of agency? Can our sense of free will in any way affect our actions? Or does science prove that free will has no role at all? This was the challenge that one team in the Big Questions of Free Will project took on. The team has found a clever way to eliminate agency or conscious awareness in the decision process. I asked one team member, Talia Wheatley, a social scientist at Dartmouth, to explain. Now you have a research project, part of this big questions in free will project, that is going to use hypnosis? That's right. Uh, how's that going to work? Um, well, hypnosis is an excellent tool that is just really um, coming into its own in cognitive neuroscience. I think for a long time, science wasn't going to touch it with a 10-foot pole. And then with the advent of neuroimaging, we started to see, oh, this is a real thing. It's an altered state of consciousness. What is great about hypnosis is that you can hypnotize someone to do a behavior that would just unfold as it would normally, but they don't have the feeling of authorship of that action. And we're really interested in what's that authorship feeling doing, if anything. Which is free will. Which is free will. So the basic idea with what we want to do is use hypnosis to take away this uh, conscious awareness that you're about to move and see, do you still move if, you're, if you don't know you're about to do it? And does the neural activity look the same? Mm. If nothing changes, then it suggests that becoming aware that you're about to move isn't really instrumental to your movement. If we show the opposite, that uh, it does change things, we don't really get the movement, uh, or the um, neural activity looks completely different, then it is doing something, and we need to take that into account, and maybe I need to revise my strong Stance. That free will is an illusion. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Talia takes me to watch okay, her experiment. Here. Mm -hmm. So I want you to just relax as much as possible. Get yourself in a comfortable position. Take a few deep breaths. Once the subject is hypnotized, Talia instructs her to perform actions, actions that will be triggered after she wakes up, but without the conscious feeling that she is willing those actions herself. A little later, you will watch some video clips. She will watch a screen and squeeze a ball when she sees an arrow. She will assume that this is an involuntary action when in fact it was implanted by the hypnosis. Remember, you'll remember nothing of what has happened until I say to you, now you can remember everything. Three, two, one. Wide awake. All right, let yourself wake up. Let's go do the experiment. 
Now, as in the Libet experiment, the subject is fitted with electrodes on her scalp and arms to measure electrical impulses in her brain and muscle movements in her arms. But this time, the subject is told that the electrodes on her arms will stimulate her muscles. So she will believe that her arm movements, which are really triggered by hypnotic suggestion, are not voluntary, not affected by her conscious thoughts. You're going to be just viewing some short nature videos. Um, they'll be about 20 seconds each, and then there'll be a little pause. Talia's research assistant shows me the real-time results. So in each video clip of 20 seconds, there would be one, one squeeze. So see, she just squeezed with her left arm. So that's what a, a squeeze of the stress ball, that's what we want to see. So there she just moved her right arm, and so that's the muscle potential from her right arm. So what we'll be looking at is the data proceeding leading up right to that squeeze. Later, Talia brings the subject out of hypnosis. Now you can remember everything. Now you can remember everything. Then they reattach the electrodes and ask the subject to contract her arm muscles voluntarily to see if there is any difference when conscious decision-making enters the process. After the experiment, I meet with Talia and her partner in the project, neuroscientist Peter Tsi, to discuss and debate the results. What are we looking at? Uh, well, zero is when she made a squeeze. Right. And the red line is when she made a squeeze based on, due to the post-hypnotic suggestion. And the blue line is when she made a squeeze because she decided consciously to do so. And you can see that the lines are largely overlapping. And so what's the significance of that? Well, it shows that motor action and the accompanying readiness, readiness potentials aren't, uh, don't require the sort of feeling of authorship, of agency, of your action. They unfold um, naturally with or without it. And how does that uh, comport with uh, each of your views of the nature of free will? <laughs> We've been doing this well, for seven years. So it's, it's an old we disagree. Debate. Yeah. I think that um, it's a problem for the sense that we have that at any moment we could decide to do otherwise, that this conscious feeling of of being sort of free agents making decisions. This is, uh, I think, a problem for that view. Peter, you disagree with that, I think. Well, I mean, I think that, uh, I don't think we have, you know, proven that consciousness plays no role. We've shown that consciousness is not necessary for making a volitional or endogenous motor act. But that is not where free will lies. It lies in this totally different domain where you're trying to decide who to marry you're trying to decide uh, whether to learn Spanish or... Although the question is, why do we have a feeling... I, I, I agree with you that this is relatively meaningless, but we still have a sense of when we decided to do it, why do we have it? These kinds of judgments that we're talking about, these are a retrospective. They're due to a comparison of what's intended or planned and what is actually being executed. Talia's and I, we've had these debates for seven years now. So ever since she came to Dartmouth, we've been duking it out. I think actually we agree. We don't agree on the definition of the term free will. That's where the disagreement okay. What does free will mean? I think it means that I could choose otherwise in the moment. Right, and I think it means that you can choose otherwise in the future. The fact that we found an example where um, consciousness appears not to play a role in subsequent acts doesn't mean that consciousness does not play a role in all subsequent acts. No, granted, but it does, does demonstrate it here. Sure. Talia and Peter agree that conscious awareness does not affect simple actions like squeezing a ball. But they disagree on whether that feeling of agency can affect more complex decisions like whom to marry. In Talia's view, conscious awareness is not needed for so-called free will decisions. In Peter's view, free will does not reside in these simple decisions. We can choose otherwise, but not in the present, in the future. In project leader Al Mealy's view, the big fear was that the brain was making all the decisions unconsciously and we became conscious of them later. We now have good evidence that that's uh, false, that what's happening at this earlier time, about half a second before the action, 
isn't that a decision's been made. It's something pre-decisional and something that may or may not lead to a decision a bit later. So more people are agreeing that that line of research now can be stopped and we can move on to new research. If that's right, that's progress. Free will is not getting any simpler. In part two, I dig deeper. I follow the big questions in Free Will Project to explore the psychological, moral, and social aspects of free will. Does any of this get us closer to truth? For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com. This program was supported in part by a grant from the John Templeton Foundation.